GCS is present since long and we are very all very familiar with it. If a new thing comes, it will take time uh, to get familiar and uh, get as popular or a little less than that. Uh, so we should uh, like uh, thank Dr. Rajesh all of her nice presentation and thank you very much for your attention during this session. Thank you, Chairpersons. We begin the last session for today. I invite the chairpersons for the last session. It's going to be about neuro recognition and neuro rehabilitation and neuro trauma. Dr. Ashima Nehru, additional professor in clinical neuropsychology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Professor Singh, Professor of Physical, Medic Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And Dr. Lindsay Wilson, who is a neuropsychologist from the Department of Psychology at the University of Stirling. We'd like to start the session now with uh, Dr. Singh talking about neuro rehab for spinal injured, how we do it. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Frankly speaking, I'll just be talking about the outline. The outline of the outline is uh, not very great. I'll be covering just a few things about what we normally do, what, not really, what most of the people normally do and uh, then come on to what we try to do and what we intend to do in the end. Most of us know these things. Whenever somebody comes with a spinal cord injury, we have uh, to carry the person well, and then most of them, this is how most of the people are carried, despite having spinal cord injury and people knowing how to do the evacuation. When they reach the hospital, the first thing they get is a catheter, and investigations are done, and they are mostly uh, I mean, subjected to surgery. The newer one, newer implants are the older kinds, the bigger ones. And also, in certain places, implants like this, which gives us a false sense of security, uh, not really serving the purpose of uh, including stabilization. Some people are, most people are given braces, depending upon the level and the extent of injury. And uh, that is how. Uh, they would be weaned off and then maybe subjected to exercises and some on the wheelchair and some on the calipers, sta learning to stand. And most would achieve sort of a partial independence, I would say, uh, they are more cared for rather than made independent. Most of the times what we falter to tell them is uh, what is the aim of the treatment? What do we expect out of the treatment? whether the surgery is going to cure or we have stem cells which are going to give us a cure and those who have it they forget they don't do any exercises they don't do any participation otherwise how much time they have to spend in the bed and how long a bed has to be used these are all things most of the people don't know and if a caliper has to be given how much functionality with that caliper or the wheelchair can be achieved if we go into the definition of rehabilitation we look at the four aspects, the physical, psychological, psychological, social, and the vocational aspects, and we try to restore the person to the fullest as much extent as is possible for the patient. And when the patient comes to rehab, the first thing is to prevent further damage to the spinal cord and to prevent complications. And try to bring the person back to life as soon as is possible. Of course, when they are on the bed rest, they need a hard bed, and a soft mattress so that they don't develop the pressure ulcers and have adequate positioning of the upper extremity as well as the 
prevention of the contractures giving any splints. It's very simple to keep the functional position of the limbs during the rest period and also institute range of motion either manually or using the equipment or using the uh, suspension slings, etc. So the early, during the early management, while we're protecting the spinal cord, we also have to look at the respiratory uh, in involvement and see in case they require ventilation, give assisted cuffing, and prevent any DVT or embolic phenomena, et cetera, give anticoagulants. Of course, even during the bedtime, they would be doing the breathing exercises or using some pumps to prevent the DVT. And uh, after they are being through the bed rest, depending upon the time, the level of injury and the kind of surgery done, they would be subjected to the exercises and then decide on the ambulation, uh, short distances versus long distance and also work on this self-care and the activities <coughs> of daily living. Many a people forget that the trunk is the most important thing to first strengthen in case that's left and having a balance before they are made to stand. And upper limb extra has to be strengthened in case whatever power is there, depending upon the level. And uh, unless that is strengthened, even transferring on the wheelchair and being independent is difficult they have to overcome their postural hypotension using the tilt table and then trying to maintain uh, the balance uh, in throwing and catching and then learning to stand first on the tilt table, then on the parallel bar and ultimately come onto the walker or the crutches depending upon what is the level. Most of the people with conus corda injury can be community walkers using the calipers, mostly the below knee calipers. And the trend to L1, fortunately, is one of the commonest level after the cervical spine they are household ambulators using the calipers and crutches. And D6 to D9, it's good to stand, at least for the sake of exercise, but they cannot achieve ambulation outside most of the times. The therapeutic activities to strengthen the upper extremity and to make them work, attain balance, entertain, all this is important through the occupation therapy. They have to be made independent, either by themselves or using some devices or under supervision rather than giving manual help. They have to transfer to the toilet and be independent, so they require bars around the toilets. Of course, this will be too much to talk about, but I would say that depending upon the level in the cervical spine injury, the independence can come. And as you would see that even a person with the C6 level can transfer from the wheelchair to the bed and become a little bit of independent and rather not be dependent. And at C7 level can achieve driving in case it is possible that we have adequate gadgets to modify the car. So in case the person doesn't have any movement even in the hand, depending upon how he can control the environment around, how he can move the wheelchair, how he can draw the curtains or uh, do various functional activities using the environmental control units. Independent transfers are very not taught so very well. You'd seen somebody being lifted and then put on the wheelchair. It is possible even with a C6 level injury. Those people who don't have adequate control in the upper extremity don't have enough power. They would be given the powered wheelchairs. Depending upon the kind of control, either you can have a joystick or a sip and puff control. You remember Denzel Washington in the movie Bone Collector using the sip and puff device, those who want to recollect that. Modern day, of course, we don't have it except for a couple of uh, people here who have used the motorized external orthosis to walk instead of the regular calipers. And FES is still in the lab, though it is not that very functionally useful in the community so very much. Robotic gait training for those who learn to stand, but they still don't have adequate power, giving the body weight support, suspending the person onto the frame, and having the robo give them the feeling of at least be able to walk. Uh, it is good for those people who have partial recovery, but uh, still quite expensive and difficult to do. We give a wheelchair and we forget about the barriers. So to take care of the barriers, we have special adaptation so that they can go around, even help the caregiver to look after that. Cars are absolutely important and having ramps which can be folded onto the car or the person going up the car and sitting or taking the wheelchair into the car and driving. This type of things are also possible in India, like many people have modified the Maruti van to do this kind of stuff. 
with the hand controls having the wheelchair locked into the car. The car conversions become very, very technical, but not many people in India are doing it, but it is possible to do it having all the hand controls and people driving independently, going into the car and driving, going to other things. Now, there are a number of other problems in addition to ambulation. Pressure sore is one of the big things. The important thing is to relieve pressure and check every day and avoid any kind of a noxious stimuli so that they can't, don't turn into pressure ulcers. When they are sitting, lying down we take care. When they are sitting, they have to have a cushion appropriately and check every day and relieve pressure very frequently. So the thing is in the beginning to avoid damage, educate the patient about the risk and look after any minor abrasion or injury. Otherwise they become very grotesque and people beg to die once they have pressure ulcers like that. And once they are there, we have to still relieve pressure, that's a key factor. Remove any kind of a dead tissue or a slough. Treat anemia and give adequate proteins, give good nutrition and when required surgical closure and in case any bony prominence is very hardly coming out so that can be rounded off. So bladder cannot be overemphasized or underemphasized. We have to prevent over distension and store and pass at will, which is the importance of the uh, thing, so that if the patient remains odor free and remains social. So self-intermittent catheterization, clean self-intermittent catheterization is one of the key things. We have to preserve the renal function and continence. So people, wherever possible, we try to give intermittent catheterization because that's in the long run having less number of amount of complications compared to the indwelling ones. Treat all the complications right from the meatal infection right up to the kidney. Uh, so all these uh, complications of UTI. Detrusor hyperreflexia is also pretty common. Anticholinergics most of the times are good. And in case uh, people have difficulty uh, the anterior, the uh, sorry, the sacral anterior root stimulator or uh, doing surgical procedures to augment the bladder. Intravesical capsaicin is something new which is coming up to prevent the detrusor hyperactivity. We have to look for and treat the complications in the lower track as well as the upper track, uh, depending on. And this is something relatively new. I've seen a couple of patients who have used for emptying of the bladder using the implantable device inside. Vowel is uh, one of the most neglected things and people keep having lot many problems so fiber and fluid is the important thing, regulating the diet and having evacuation when the person wants rather than having accidents. That is the important thing. So depending upon whether the bowel is reflexive or irreflexive, we have a regimen, we can teach those people. I'm not going to the details because of shortage of time. Autonomic dysreflexia is one of the emergencies in such patients. We say in PMR we are very cool, but autonomic dysreflexia is one of the things which may kill the patient immediately. So we s look for such patients about level D6 and they come with bradycardia and uh, hypertension because overall blood pressure is lower in patients with uh, higher lesions. Say cervical injury, most of the people would have something like 90 or 100 BP. So anything like 120, 140 would also again uh, we should be careful about. So we have to look for the cause in such a thing, sit the patient and give nifadipine or such drugs to lower the blood pressure. So spasticity is again one of the common things. So we see whether spasticity is interfering or it is uh, helping the patient. So accordingly, we treat if it interferes and uh, most of the things which aggravate the spasticity are certain infections or some kind of a stimuli coming from within. Give drugs, baclofen in the higher doses, most of the people are better with the 75 to 150 milligrams in a day. So that's a kind of thing. Local botulinum and other surgical things are there. Those who require higher doses can be given uh, baclofen intrathecally, and this is a simpler procedure. So contractures can't be highlighted that very much, so we have to prevent them by maintaining the range of motion and positioning, and obviously do stretching whenever required. Sexuality is one of the neglected things, so we have to redefine depending upon what is remaining in the patient and explore the alternatives. So we look at, important thing is the counseling, looking at the extra genital sex, or in case we require genital sex, we have various devices for erection of the penis or for the sake of having 
artificial insemination of having sperms to come out using electro ejaculation. So penile processes can be fitted surgically or giving papaverine locally. Chronic pain is there in 30 to 90% of the patients and we have lot many things and very difficult to treat. Less than 50% get better having a combination of medication. Psychological, I think I will leave it to Dr. Rashima Nehra. So important thing is telling the caregiver how to do it, how to take care of these people. But the patients keep waiting and their relatives keep waiting for the some kind of a cure. So they keep running around and they think calipers is only temporary. They have to keep going to the hospital till the time they can get rid of it and they stop living their life after injury. So it is important to reintegrate these people into the community. They have to learn about working, how they can get the best benefit out of this. So government also gives the benefits. So they have to be made pray, uh, aware about that. And these are a few challenges which remain all through, specifically in India. These challenges can be reduced to some extent giving counseling in the group and giving them vocational training and in engaging them into recreational activities as far as is possible so that they can live their life in a better manner. We keep talking about access and barriers, but such kind of facilities are not available even though we have built up bus stops which can have a better access, but still we don't have adequate buses or people's mindset and the barriers still remain all through the life. So the important message is to make them participate in whatever way they can enjoy their life and live it fully. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you Professor Yu Singh. If there is any question from the audience. We send to you after three months when you discharge from the hospital and all the contract care, all this. So what is most important for to understand is the rehabilitation early. should start 48 hours per injury so that sooner you start in a protocol based rehabilitation. What is your comment about that? Actually, the, I was trained in the Stoke Medical Hospital UK. They used to start on the day one rather than waiting for day. day uh, even what those uh, who are not subjected to surgery, day one PMR takes up the spinal cord injury. So there's <laughs> absolutely no point in delaying. Can you do it or why can't we all do it? Uh, I think it is primarily the mindset, setup. Mindset. Yes, mindset as, a, as well as the setup, the facilities in the various places. Is there any other question? Thank you, Sir. Professor Yusin. Thank you, Thank you so much. At the outset, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Yu Singh, P Professor Lindsay, for giving me an opportunity to talk here. And I'll also like to thank Dr. Deepa Gupta for this opportunity. Today I'm presenting neuropsychological assessment and rehabilitation in neurosurgical conditions and in AIMS experience. That's the outline. Now. Uh, according to the WHO, the use of all possible means to minimize impact of disabling and condition for that autonomy and participation is a must. And we've used the principles of neuropsychological rehabilitation, which is repair. Of course, uh, a lot has been stated regarding neuropsychological rehabilitation and a lot of support and literature is available. Uh, the problems which are faced by the patients who are brain uh, injured could be motor, cognitive, behavioral, social, emotional, etc. And the philosophy of rehabilitation is identifying the defective link. 
So we need to identify the behavioral outcome of acquired brain injury using individualized approach towards participation and also monitoring changes over time and also use uh, it by identifying these impairments and compare it with radiological and physiological counterparts. Neuropsychological rehabilitation approach uh, as should normally be followed as we are trying to attempt is cognitive impairment with the individual characteristics, the environment, and of course the physical and the functional symptoms, put all of them together. So what is most important is the pre-morbid functioning, the emotional reaction of the person and the family members, also the organic changes in emotions and behavior. In clinical sense, of course, organ an organic brain pathology refers to pathological condition which may be uh, arising out of the structural, toxic, or metabolic dysfunction in comparison to the different uh, personal factors, the cognitive, the calculation, learning ability, and etc. Uh, the importance of neuropsychological assessment started long ago where the focus was most, mostly on localization of the lesion, which probably came as an advent to the concepts from Luria, Nebraska and Helstead uh, health Retina test batteries, which prob was probably developed before the invent of uh, radio diagnostic procedures like uh, CAT, MRI, PET, etc. It was thought to be very important because it was a non-invasive procedure through which um, non-traumatically the person could be evaluated and hence the, some uh, processing of the brain could be evaluated. However, the scenario has now changed. And now the focus is more in terms of the assessment of deterioration of functions of psychological functions in the various broad domains. Uh, if we talk of neuropsychology, there could be two concepts as was stated in one of the earlier talks. Uh, regarding the psychometric and the ideometric technique as is mostly used as a bedside tool by uh, the clinicians where GCS is used is the ideometric technique where it is or it is not is a format whereas psychometric principles is what neuropsychology follows upon. So hence a neuropsychological evaluation should be standardized, should be intensive, sensitive, scaled, precise and there should be interpretation. Unless it is there, only then it can be recapulated, it can be compared, and again, we can know about the processing of the person's ability. So hence, an, it should uh, entail cognitive functioning, behavioral functioning, and emotional functioning, all of that put together, and that's what we would call a comprehensive neuropsychological assessment. W what is very important is to use tests which are standardized in India. Uh, only the popularity of the test in which is foreign in any of the papers doesn't mean it gives a good value. You need to find and use a test which is more appropriate to an Indian condition. Let's take an example of you trying to uh, evaluate a person's comprehension ability and you're giving a card with some picture of some event, for example, picnic, to a person who's come from a poor background who's probably not ever had an opportunity to know what picnic is all about. So hence, the response to any of such picture or the test that you use is going to be an incorrect prediction and reporting. Hence, you need to pick up tests which are appropriate. Let's take an, you know, a test, uh, for example, assessment of the auditory ability discrimination of a person. These are two pictures which have been created by us, which is Makki and Makki. So discriminating between the two versus picking up any test which is foreign and then you translate it would make no diff would not be a correct approach. So the key issues in neuropsychological rehabilitation are restoration and, uh, and versus compensation, including also identifying the defective links uh, in order to kind of retrain a person. Hence, it is important for you clinicians to clarify the diagnosis, to know the degree, to evaluate the severity of impairment, to make um, and establish a, some kind of a comparison, and also to, to uh, design a specific targeted cognitive treatment plan with a prediction of an outcome, and also look at how you can eventually take the patient back to the normal state, and also for litigation purposes. So the pattern as we follow at AIMS is assess the patient on some standardized tools, and then uh, do a rehabilitation and reevaluate the same person on the basis of qualitative and quantitative structured format 
what we call an AB experimental format with the team where neurosurgeons, neurologists and others, including us, are a part of it. So the comprehensive neuropsychological rehabilitation um, gives an intervention for remediation of the various neuropsychological parameters using a model where mm, P as in the patient, I is the intervention, C is the comparison, and O is the outcome. And this is based on systematic reviews, randomized controlled, double-blind clinical trials, so that we know which of the parameters are important to be worked upon, with, which have a clinical evidence, and with the clinician's experience, and also in, in, uh, in helping the patient uh, and his values and preferences. And hence, a complete rehabilitation is to integrate and take the patient back to the community. Now, uh, I would say that AIMS experience for me started from a PJ experience, where when we just started this kind of a center, where we were trying to look at if um, an assessment of any of the other procedures can actually be also seen in a neuropsychological assessment. And we did find that there was a strong correlation between an impaired uh, CT also showed an impaired neurocognitive functioning. Then another study where 210 uh, prospective patients of TBI and SCH were assessed on 10 cognitive domains, and, and it was found that TBI and SCH both suffer cognitive dysfunction. They had uh, more cognitive dysfunction due to impact of sociodemographic profile. And uh, the younger and the unmarried males had more cognitive dysfunction, especially in TBI. And it was concluded that the primary prevention and the ter tertiary prevention was important in improving the quality of life of these patients. So keeping that in view, here coming to AIMS, we found, uh, you know, of course, uh, AIMS comprehensive test battery is what AIMS had started to work upon. And for many years, they worked upon that with the, uh, the very knowledge that the results with the damage to the brain, spinal cord, nerves, etc., does cause uh, illness and injury, and it does lead to various neurological conditions, and some of which still uh, a question mark. Hence, uh, this study was done uh, with, at Ames on 77 survivors of uh, severe traumatic brain injury, and uh, they were prospectively assessed for a period of one year, and a cognitive and functional outcome was graded and it was concluded that 61% of the patients with severe traumatic brain injury had good recovery, whereas 45% had good recovery uh, in psychological outcome at one year. However, improvement in the cognitive outcome was not so optimistic, and it was thought probably a randomized controlled clinical trial is needed for us to eventually even uh, make any claims. Hence, uh, we thought of started to, starting to work on small uh, case studies, and this is a study of a, um, a grief uh, and management of a bullet shot uh, penetrating injury, where uh, the patient was repeatedly assessed and, uh, and rehabilitation was given um, for a period of 11 months. And as you can see, that there was major improvement in the various areas that we evaluated pre-intervention. Uh, Similarly, three cases were uh, then assessed. And they were, uh, two of the cases had come immediately after uh, the head injury. And one patient had uh, reported later to after a year uh, after injury. And it was concluded a holistic and a cognitive retraining is an effective method for rehabilitation uh, or rehabilitating the moderate to severe head injury patients. And such extensive procedures may be beneficial only with the patient's compliance, family support, because we do not have specific rehabilitation beds to be rehabilitating them every day. So we have to call them once in a week uh, on an OPT level. Uh, another uh, work that was done at an OPT level and where um, a total of 23 patients uh, were assessed and they were rehabilitated. Um, and they were pre-assessed and post-assessed as per the ABA uh, experiment, a, um, uh, experimental design, as I had stated earlier. And it was found that the patient's tailored uh, NR if was effective for mild to severe injuries and improved the cognitive and psychosocial outcomes. NR was successful in uh, uh, decreasing the uh, overall dysfunction in cognitive social, vocational, personal, and family areas, despite the severity of injury and the time lapse. So whether the person had come in immediately or later, it improved. 
NR also helped decrease the post-concussive symptoms and however the limitation was that the primary caregiver was needed uh, as a home-based therapist for all of these conditions. Then we moved on to another thing which was happening in AIMS and we, we wanted to extend our services where we started to look at the patients with epilepsy and uh, we uh, assessed uh, these patients and we found that uh, uh, the inverse relationship between stigma and quality of life in India is epilepsy um, a disabling neurological condition and it was found that uh, mm, that quality of life and stigma had a strong uh, uh, connection um, and then another study was done at uh, neurosciences center where uh, um, quality of life was assessed for epilepsy surgery patients pre and post and it was found that a complete uh, seizure free state after surgery is associated with a very significant improvement in quality of life in the various parameters however it did not extend to all the areas and uh, another study that is uh, underway and uh, uh, to which we are uh, blinded is a role of a neuropsychological profiling and epilepsy surgery a longitudinal study and as I said, we are blinded to the surgical procedures and only six completed cases where uh, uh, RCT is happening and uh, uh, they were assessed on the various parameters. And it was found that there was improved neuropsychological profile uh, more in temporal lobe surgery than on radio surgery group. However, the descriptive statistics also show that there is no significant difference between groups. That is, the type of epilepsy surgery does not affect the neuropsychological profile to begin with. And uh, we concluded uh, from this small study that a neuropsychological testing is useful as a mean of prediction of a risk stratification for post-operative cognitive changes after epilepsy surgery, irrespective of the type. However, uh, it's, uh, this is too small uh, um, you know, a group or uh, uh, number to make any tall claims. And hence, the challenges are in the external competencies and also build a kind of a encoding system and also felicitate transfer of information online to go um, um, online to long-term store and hence also the errorless learning. Uh, the other issues are financial constraints like there is a lot of rehabilitation centers around world where patients are uh, put in, in a bed and where a rehabilitation is done every day. So there are distance and travel and rehabilitation and the family member uh, who can, uh, who is, uh, who has an ability to be taking up uh, the rehabilitation work at home and reporting to us at the right time, and also the burnout of uh, of spouse, especially because in terms of uh, head injury, most of the uh, head injured are men since they are uh, prone to traffic accidents, and hence the current trends in neuropsychology is undergoing a revolutionary change. It is redrawing the boundaries of the field, altering its key clinical and scientific aim in modifying the way these aims are accomplished. And also this is broad conceptual influence on the field. So the participation has to be holistic. Uh, all of this is uh, helpful to establish a baseline so that the changes in thinking, skill, mood, personality can be motivated over time, help better treatment, help the patient and the family members, help them educate and the family members and also other disorders. Also the, uh, provide information for the phys physicians for the medication and the effect of cognition uh, if uh, you know, the medicines are causing co uh, cognitive impairment. Also determine if the person's thinking, skill, mood, personality uh, are affected by neurological disorders. With that, I'd like to thank uh, you all. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. In the 80s, uh, before you had joined there, we carried out uh, uh, cog uh, cognitive and psychosexual assessment of traumatic brain injury patients. Sir. Followed them up longitudinally for up to a year. One great problem came, uh, which I'm sure is here also, is a slightly higher number of dropouts. Yes. We, we could um, counter that by arranging for either monetary aid to the patients to come to PGI or by 
sending for psychologist on a domiciliary. Right, uh, what we need certainly <coughs> is a much more longer longitudinal study of these deficits. Right, sir. Especially in severe um, right. traumatic brain injury patients. And secondly, you have to think of some way in which you can extend this rehabilitation benefits to patients in their home surroundings. So, uh, uh, regarding the first thing that you stated, you're absolutely right. The dropouts are many. Um, to counter that and not to put a pressure on the institute to give us beds, knowing the condition that was there in PGI and here. Uh, what we started to do is we've taken lists of various uh, sarais around AIMS and uh, we have taken consent uh, from the sarais to admit these patients. So when the patients are evaluated A, which I had shown in my slide, after that and we find that there is cognitive impairment in the various areas or of course if there is social support or other areas in which family members also need some kind of help we get a consent form filled. And once they consent, then we fill up a form to send them to the Sarai's. And then the Sarai allows them to stay for a period of eight weeks. Uh, one of the PhD program, uh, you know, from here, uh, is developing a randomized uh, controlled clinical trial thesis w and also developing a rehabilitation package on uh, traumatic brain injury. So then we try and attempt to do that on the patients. And then we reevaluate the patient uh, afterwards. So in a way, you're absolutely right. We would be doing it for a short time right now because till we are able to accomplish her thesis work. But eventually the plan is that we need to, you're absolutely right, uh, trail them at a later age. And uh, regarding uh, this, uh, extending the services around home, uh, I think I may be able to give an answer to that by next conference. So every time we come out with something, there is something underway and we are working on, on those parameters. Sir. Yes, sir. I'm Jamuna Rajeshwaran from Nimhans. Uh, this is regarding the home-based retaining that we have developed in Nimhans, where we have given uh, patients for one month, we give them <coughs> the package week-wise where we have uh, uh, every week the patient reports to us with the kind of tasks that we give them and they come back and we evaluate them based on which we either give them the first week or we move on to the second week based on their improvement. And we have published this particular uh, work in the Indian Journal of Neurotrauma. So this is uh, going on in Nimhans for quite some time. Dr. Shobini has uh, started this and a package, uh, home-based uh, neuropsychological rehabilitation package. So, what is the important thing? It is all body-based. It has not correlated to every patient who admitted to service. You see, what uh, we are interested as a neurosurgeon, this should be a part of the routine care or the standard of care so that every patient comes in, you will have your protocol for management. It's not that this is this package, that is that package, this is this PhD thesis, that is that is protocol based study, no. Has this become a, see I am here for 40 years, okay? And I know when the Surya Gupta joined, okay? But it is not part of the care. I understand, It is part sir. of the research or part of the PhD thesis. When it is going to a part of the standard care that a patient comes, he will be treated physiotherapy, he will put it the, then it is a total package of head injury treatment. Sir. Is it neither in the Nimhans, which is there from 1970, nor AIMS, which in our 50 years, we are not giving to human being. We are all, this is projected, this project, that project. Sir. That should be standard of care. So with the permission of the chair, may I add something? Uh, I fully echo the comments uh, raised by Dr. Mahapatra. I'm also working here for the last 16 years. Uh, I don't think we have a speech therapist with us. And uh, the patients uh, who are a part of some study or some trial, uh, they are being seen very well. Uh, I mean, or if I take some obligation from Dr. Ashima, I send my patients to her and she spends a lot of time and I see a difference in the outcome of this patient. There is no denying the fact. But what Dr. Mahapatra is talking about is that it has to be a part of the care. Maybe it's in Nimans. It is not there in all industry no. medical science. I want to say something, yeah, if please. you permit. Please. First of all, what Dr. Jamuna said, yes, we are following Dr. Shobini L. Rao's pattern. It is totally new package. We are not using theirs. 
we have we have developed an individualized package one regarding your second thing sir please give me your blessings hopefully in four years you will have what you want we are already working on it thirdly no sir i said four years that's all i'm asking because we are working on it thirdly we are uh, working in the very pattern as i had shown that grid where we are talking of integrating and taking the patient to community we are not taking upon all the patients ourselves we start a program we we design it in such a way wherever speech therapy is needed we refer the patient to a speech therapist wherever physical therapy is needed we send the patient to physical therapist while we continue our work and they have to continue maintaining their follow ups over there we make sure we ask them because we also meet them once in a week and we meet them eight times total in um, in, in the total program and then follow ups is what we maintain telephonic as well as personal i think uh, we'll put an end to the discussion since we are short of time sorry so may we move on to the thank you very thank much you, sir. dr thank Nella. you sir may we move on to the next speaker professor lindsay wilson from the university of sterling united kingdom mission this year i think one of the delegate has lost his cell phone um, nokia cell phone small one i think it's, it's a, he has dropped it somewhere dr koshi so in case you happen to find it somewhere please uh, just let us know Thank you. Could I have the slides, please? Well, thank you very much to Dr. Deepak Gupta for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here to be, have the chance to talk to you about uh, outcomes, and particularly about uh, mild brain injury. Um, as I said, I'm from the University of Stirling, which is in central Scotland. But actually, most of my work uh, was been, has been conducted here at the Institute of Neurological Sciences in Glasgow. And of course, that's the home of the Glasgow Coma Scale and the Glasgow Outcome Scale. And early in my career, I had the uh, uh, opportunity to work with the people who developed those scales, with uh, Brian Jeanette, Mike Bond. And I collaborated for many years with uh, Graham Teasdale. And what, uh, what these people all shared was uh, an interest in assessment of TBI and is seeing that as important, and also an interest in outcomes even if the scales that they developed were not, were by no means perfect. Uh, moving on, my main work at the moment is with the Centre TBI project. This is a large scale project designed to answer questions about what, uh, what works and what doesn't work in terms of management of TBI. Uh, and also to better characterise TBI, because at the moment we really do not have tools that properly characterise the, the heterogeneity to let us classify the different forms of the injury in anything more than a very crude sense. And as part of that project, we're collecting uh, data from a large number of cases, over 5,000, uh, and that database will be a rich source which will be available to other people as well once, uh, once the project's complete for uh, getting lessons about, uh, about, uh, about traumatic brain injury. So what's the state of play concerning mild brain injury? Well, it's certainly a huge problem. This uh, is the mild brain injury in the UK. Around one million people a year seek hospital uh, treatment for TBI in the UK. And about 80% of those will have uh, a mild, mild TBI or a concussion. That is, they'll uh, go to the ER uh, and they'll be treated there and they'll be sent home without, act, without being admitted to hospital. But we know that a proportion of those, uh, around 10 to 15%, will have persisting problems. And given persisting symptoms, they'll also have limitations. They potentially have limitations in, in social interaction and participation, but also in, in work. The, these, the kinds of problems that pretty, pretty people experience are likely to interfere with their work. And then there's another group that we know nothing about, those that don't seek medical care at all, that we don't know how many people there are out there who have mild brain injuries that just never go to hospital. Um, the most the easiest uh, thing to identify in a mild brain injury are the, are the symptoms. And this is a study done uh, by Landshow in Sweden. It's a community-based study with uh, uh, over 2,500 uh, patients with a mild brain injury who they followed up 
uh, at three months. And this is the distribution of, uh, of symptoms that they found. And as you can see, the familiar ones, fatigue, uh, headaches, dizziness, poor memory, irritability, poor concentration, were really, really quite common in this, uh, in this group. All over 10% uh, of cases reported uh, these symptoms. And 23% uh, of, uh, of the sample uh, reported three or more symptoms. And that represents a, a, a clinically significant uh, if, uh, a burden on these patients, having these, these uh, symptoms after injury. Now, one of the debates in the mild head injury field has been whether these, these uh, community samples are uh, representative. And one of the uh, uh, issues has been whether sports people uh, uh, suffer the same kind of consequences. And this is uh, uh, from uh, a study done a number of years ago, uh, it's actually 2003, uh, as by McCrea with the American football players. Now, the nice thing about these sports injury studies is that you can uh, assess people. Um, <clears throat> you can assess people before the uh, before they, they start the season. So you've got a baseline assessment. Then you can assess them when they actually have the concussion because you observe it on the on the playing field. And then you can do serial assessment over the succeeding period. So you've got a, you can chart out the actual resolution of these symptoms. And in this case, what appears to be happening is that the symptoms seem to be going away with the first seven days, which conflicts with the, uh, the picture from the community sample of protracted symptoms. So uh, one of the possibilities is perhaps these are particularly mild or perhaps uh, there's some other differences. But in fact, it turned out that uh, if one uh, looks at uh, l uh, larger groups and subdivides them, you still find a subgroup within these sports injuries that uh, is suffering protracted symptoms. So this is a, a more recent study from the same group. Uh, so the, the typical picture, as before, is the resolution of symptoms over a period of a week. That would be about 90% of cases. But there's another group, a subgroup, who don't show that pattern, who show higher, higher symptoms initially and whose symptoms last for longer. And indeed, they're not uh, resolved uh, even by three months post-injury, as in the community samples. And uh, in parallel with that, uh, there's a recovery of cognitive function, but it's a, a, as, as in parallel, uh, parallel with the symptoms, we're coming to somewhere close to the uh, uh, control or baseline level by three months. So the picture of the uh, protracted symptoms uh, and a uh, cognitive impairment is, is true for both the uh, sports injuries and also the community samples. Uh, one of the uh, uh, controversies has in the area has been whether there's a distinctive post-concussional syndrome. Is there something we can identify that's specific to TBI and these patterns of symptoms? And in the, in the, in the early 90s, there was two, two sets of diagnostic criteria for the, uh, suggested for the post-concussional syndrome. And both of these required uh, a report of three or more symptoms, and they, and they had additional criteria uh, uh, built into them, which, which differed in, 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 in respects. And persistent uh, PCS was defined as these symptoms lasting for more than three months. Uh, but that, uh, that idea, this idea that there's a specific diagnostic category, has not fared, fared well over the years. This is a study uh, by Bork looking at uh, the two different uh, uh, assess assessment diagnostic systems. Uh, same patients, 11% were diagnosed in DSM-4 as having a P a PCS, whereas 64% were un, uh, diagnosed in ICD-10. So a big discre di discrepancy there between uh, the diagnosis of PCS by different systems. And primarily, uh, DCM requires cognitive impairment, whereas ICD-10 doesn't. But also there you can see that extracranial injuries also showed uh, a diagnosis of, 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 of post-concussional syndrome. So the, the, the diagnosis is not, is not is, 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 is not precise, and also that, that it wasn't specific, particularly to brain injury. And that message has also come across from work by Iverson, uh, showing that you can find uh, post-concussional symptoms in depressed patients. And here you see the, uh, the typical picture, the typical symptoms of, uh, uh, of uh, post-concussional syndrome. 
uh, and their severity and in this depressed patient, with the blue lines being mild and the yellow lines being moderate or severe symptoms, so clinically significant symptoms. And as you can see, these are really, really common in, in depressed patients, and in fact, more common in these patients than in, that, uh, in the general uh, mild head injury group. And in that study, 90% of, uh, of the patients, of these depressed patients, met a diagnostic criteria for <coughs> a post-concussion syndrome. So the syndrome itself is that has, not, uh, has not done well. Uh, and the, it's summarized here uh, and defined by these two systems. There's problems with the incident rate, incidence rate, depending on which system you use. And the symptoms are shared between different conditions, such as depression. So that diagnosis has now been dropped. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, the, the existence of, of persisting symptoms itself is not, uh, is not in question. But just the, the specificity of it uh, as, a, as a marker in TBI. The thing that has come out uh, strongly in more recent work is an association with uh, PTSD. And this has come uh, primarily from studies of uh, people returning from the war, uh, uh, the wars in uh, uh, Iran and, uh, 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 and sorry, in Af Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, so American studies with American soldiers uh, showing that uh, 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 mild t TBI is associated with higher levels of uh, depression, of uh, PTSD, and also of somatic symptoms. So here you can see uh, pe uh, people returning with, who had an injury with a loss of consciousness, injury with altered mental state, other injury, or no injury. And you can see the, the, um, the number, the percentage of pe people here, 44% in this group had uh, PTSD, whereas it was 16% with other injuries. And this is, this is, this is indicating that it's not, it's not involvement in the injury as such or involvement in, uh, in combat that's uh, a response that's uh, uh, creating this difference. It's actually the, the mild TBI as a, <coughs> as a separate uh, uh, predictor. <coughs> so that, uh, that has led to a lot of debate about the relationship between PTSD and mild TBI. So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we've got a, a picture here of our persisting symptoms in a subgroup or a miserable minority, as Ruff calls it. Cognitive differences between patients with and without symptoms and mild TBI is a risk factor for depression, PTSD and other mental health problems. And one of the questions has been whether that uh, represents a psychological phenomenon uh, uh, due to the, uh, a psychological reaction to the event, or whether there's actually damage to the brain and un underlying these differences. And there is, there is now fairly convincing evidence of the latter. There's been a number of uh, studies using uh, imaging techniques, but the most convincing evidence to my mind comes from uh, diffusion ten tension er imaging, which uh, uh, shows uh, abnormalities in white matter tracts of people with, uh, uh, with mild brain injury. <coughs> and <coughs> in this, uh, this particular study, they looked at, at patients with, uh, who were abnormal on either MR or CT and found these, uh, these differences. So there's a hint here that uh, what we have is, a, is a within the mild head injury group, is heterogeneity and the mildness. There's a severe end and a, and a, and a, and a truly mild group uh, uh, involved. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> So one of the, uh, another thing I wanted to talk about was the consequences <coughs> of repeated concussion. There's been a lot of concern about repetitive, uh, repetitive concussion in sports as a cause of chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy. <coughs> and the evidence uh, for this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, comes from boxers. Uh, this is well known, of course, that uh, boxers ha uh, have uh, show patterns of, uh, of chronic uh, uh, a, a degeneration, but also more recently in American football players, and that's caused a lot of uh, uh, concern and debate, particularly in the United States. And of course, head, in, head impacts are common in a wide variety of sports, including rugby, hockey, American football, uh, uh, soccer, and martial arts. So there's been a lot of concern about this kind of uh, uh, particular uh, injury. 
Uh, and this is the observations by Omar Lou on uh, American football players who showed patterns of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And what I think is interesting about this is that uh, what he found was uh, a progressive deterioration, not only affecting a, a, a cognitive function, loss of memory, loss of language, a, a loss of executive functioning, but also a patterns of a social deterioration, breakdown in relationships, and also mental health problems such as major depression and also violent and uh, criminal behaviour. So there's a, there's a commonality there between what is observed from this, these uh, concussive, uh, this per, from the effects of repeated uh, concussion and some of the uh, uh, views about the early symptomology. <coughs> <coughs> what we don't know from this work is uh, what <coughs> the incidence and prevalence of chronic traumatic uh, encephalopathy is. So we've got no idea uh, whether uh, repeated, how often repeated concussion uh, actually produces this deterioration. We also know that a single TBI is known to be a risk factor for the development of AD, but we don't know whether that's connected also to the development of uh, CTE. And also we don't know whether subconcussive <coughs> head trauma also produces uh, brain changes. And just uh, in a few minutes, I just uh, we're, we're interested in this particular issue about whether subconcussive uh, head injury could produce uh, 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 changes in the brain. What we have is a setup for looking at football heading to see whether that would produce uh, changes. And one would expect it wouldn't because foot heading and football are seen as being completely safe. So we have this uh, an, a machine which fires balls at people and they, they head them repeatedly. And we're looking at uh, trans transcranial magnetic stimulation as evoked uh, uh, potential for uh, the motor evoked potentials. Uh, and uh, what we're doing then is uh, having uh, uh, people come in, they do, they do cognitive testing, we do balance, and we do this transcranial magnetic stimulation, so we have a baseline. They do a period of heading the, the football, and then we repeat the testing, and so we can look to see if there's any changes uh, uh, over that time. And what we found in a pilot study is there's uh, a significant uh, change in the... Uh, in, in, in over that first period, there's a transient change in the motor evoked potential. So it seems that even in this extremely mild uh, condition, there's actually uh, physiological responses uh, to this short-term uh, head impact, repetitive impact, impact. So we don't, at the moment, this is not, this is not evidence of, uh, of, uh, uh, of brain injury in any way, but it's a, but it's a, it's a significant change and something that one, uh, that uh, maybe is slightly worrying and we need to know more about the effects of repetitive injuries. So just, uh, just this fi the final slide on this, on uh, mild head injuries, what we do about it, what's, uh, what can we uh, do? Well, firstly, a critical issue is about early diagnosis. We know that if we can get people early, if we can identify people with mild brain injury, that's important and it can be, can be given help. Uh, patient education, people should be given uh, information about the likely consequences. They should know, firstly, that the symptoms are likely to resolve, but some people will suffer uh, prolonged consequences. And then, uh, <coughs> for, then there should be a, a way of identifying patients with uh, persisting problems. And I've listed here some simple uh, screening tests that can be used, the River Mead post-concussion symptom questionnaire, uh, a depression questionnaire, anxiety questionnaire, post-traumatic stress disorder. These are really simple to give to people, uh, but they will identify people with significant mental health problems as a, result of, uh, as a result of mild TBI. And then if you identify people, then there's, pos then there's the possibility of referring for appropriate help. And as part of uh, the Centre TBI project, what we're hoping to do is to uh, uh, is illuminate the issue of the early diagnosis of mild, ter uh, mild traumatic brain injury, because we know scales such as the GCS are inadequate to do that. We need other techniques that will help us. We'll look and see whether patient education is, uh, is uh, occurring and what help it is, and also look at the, these, these scales and whether they're able to identify uh, uh, the groups of patients. And that's the end of that. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Okay.
Okay, sir, any questions, please? Yes. What is the percentage of patients in head injury, traumatic brain injury patients, who need active intervention by neuropsychologists? And what <coughs> is the percentage of patients who get treatment at UK? Um, well, the percentage uh, who, would need, who would potentially need some help would be, as I say, 10 to 15 percent of the 80 percent with the uh, mild brain injury. So, um, and then the then the other 20 percent are there will be the more at the more severe end and should get help as well. So we're really talking about a very substantial uh, proportion of the of the people with head injury. Not as many as should. <laughs> I did a lot of uh, work on the minor head injury uh -huh. uh, in the last 30 years. We studied <coughs> the P53 delayed hypopotential. We also did the transcranial Doppler. We did spec scan. Uh -huh. And to our surprise, for six months, the spec scan, repeated spec scan shows that there is adult there is a frontal lobe hypoperfusion, uh -huh. and in children, it is the temporal lobe hypoperfusion. So we said, what obviously look a minor, minor <coughs> head injury with normal CT scan, with a Glasgow coma cell 14, 15, is not minor. No. It has lot of psychosocial, physiological, electrophysiological, and cerebral blood flow problem. So it is what we discarded, and recently we also know there is a testosterone and insulin-like growth factor deficiency. And many of these post-concussion syndrome patients benefit from testosterone therapy or, or hormone therapy like growth hormone. So what is your comment on that? And what's about music therapy? In 1940, the Los Angeles started a music center for the traumatic brain injury. So what is your concept in UK, music therapy for post-concussion syndrome? Um, well, I think the observation about minor brain injury not being minor is, uh, is very important, and that's really the sort of key thing here, that uh, there is a subgroup that, uh, that are not genuinely minor that have uh, brain changes. Um, the, I mean, the ideas, ideas for tr treating the problems, are, 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 I, I think, are interesting, but clearly we need to develop an evidence base uh, uh, and part of the problem with the many of the, I mean, well, we're not, it's not a problem, but uh, it's, it's the, an issue of getting an adequate funding to, to test these ideas and to, to look at, to... to uh, <laughs> India has <laughs> about 500 million people with one dollar a day. Yes. That is not applicable for US or UK. You That's are the people who are blessed people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might it might look like that. It might look like that, but in fact, there's still there's a lot of constraints, and uh, it's not possible to fully investigate all the things that one would uh, like to. And that's really the truth of it. And part of the part of the sh the uh, purpose of a project like Centre TBI is to is, is to try and establish things that m which might work, and then to argue for a randomized controlled trial to, uh, to establish whether they do or not. What is our music therapy? <laughs> there have been quite a few uh, interventions in music, specifically coming in from, head in head injury, yes. Uh, specifically <coughs> coming from the south of India, Tamil Nadu, Coimbatore, it's been tried and it's really very effective. I can't personally comment on that. <coughs> Sorry. Absolutely. Thank you for your presentation, sir. I wanted to ask your experience from the University of Stirling and the University of Glasgow, how the patients of mild uh, brain injury and concussion, how do they come to you? Do all patients, are, are they seen by you? Or what is the flow? 
like you said, how important assessment and rehabilitation is for these patients. What is the experience in both these universities where you work, you've worked? In, uh, simply, they're, they're not seen. There's no follow-up of people with mild tra uh, brain injuries uh, uh, systematically in the UK. So it remains a problem that's out there in the community. We don't, uh, and we're not recognizing it. So whatever, whoever patients, they are seen there only for research purposes. Yes, exactly. Although um, I think it's probably in this, the, sports, uh, the sports context, there's probably more attention given to people and more follow-up. But uh, uh, generally people that, are, that come in with a mild brain injury, they're just dis discharged home and that's that. And there isn't any follow-up for any uh, of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilson. I think, uh, would you like to have the second talk right away, sir? Yes, sure, yes, please. So, I want to continue the theme of the uh, uh, assessment we're talking uh, about. Your attention, please, to the talk. Thank you. Talking about the challenge of uh, multidimensional outcome assessment, because um, the history here is that uh, the, the scale that's been uh, you almost uh, universally used, it's certainly in clinical trials in, in traumatic brain injury uh, and particularly in acute brain injury has been the Glasgow Outcome Scale. So the focus uh, from neurosurgical trials has been on the Glasgow Outcome Scale. And the, 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 it has, it has uh, a number of strengths, it's a simple scale, the basic structure allows you to, you're making decisions about, some fairly simple decisions about, about the person, uh, are they alive or are they dead? And uh, you can classify them. Are they conscious or unconscious? If they're unconscious, they're in the vegetative state. Uh, are they independent or dependent? If they're dependent, they're, in, they're severely disabled. Uh, or have they returned to normal life? Or do they have limitations in major roles, such as uh, work or uh, participation in social and leisure activities? So it's a simple scale that allows you to classify people in a hierarchical way. Um, the Glasgow Outcome Scale in its own way is multidimensional. It's what it's attempting to do is to, uh, is to capture uh, uh, the uh, disability caused by head injury, uh, the individual limitations and impairments uh, by looking at uh, limitations in major social roles. So you're just looking at whether people are dependent or not and also whether they have limitations in relationships in their work or in their leisure participation, and then finally whether they have disabling symptoms. So it's an attempt to, to capture some of the, the much of the multidimensional aspects in some rather simple way. But that, as a, that simplicity obviously has its own uh, limitations. One of the problems that, uh, that uh, Graham and I uh, uh, discovered with the use of the Glasgow Outcome Scale was that it was not being done in a standardized way, even in, in Glasgow. And we, were, we asked around in Glasgow about how they applied the scale, and people came up with quite different answers. And what we did uh, uh, together was to produce a, a structured version of the Glasgow Outcome Scale, which also includes uh, extended uh, categories of upper and lower severe disability in the, uh, in the uh, uh, categories of uh, survival. And basically the idea here is you ask a standard set of questions and you get, have criteria for assigning an outcome. And, and it was uh, an attempt to try and uh, standardize application of the Glasgow Outcome Scale uh, and, and, and also provide a, a slightly more differentiated uh, uh, scale which could be used in clinical trials. Uh, but as time goes, has gone on, it's been clear that uh, this is certainly this is not enough. Uh, it's certainly not. It's not enough uh, uh, anyway uh, for for rehab, where you need much more detailed uh, assessment of uh, the patient, and it's not even enough for clinical trials. We need to know more. We need to have a more holistic uh, picture of the uh, of uh, of the patient. 
So there's been a re recognition of a need to capture a range of outcomes, and that's resulted in various initiatives to try and develop uniform sets of uh, information that could be collected in research studies. And there have been, uh, there's been a, a, an ICF uh, initiative, but this particular in in initiative was uh, NIN's initiative, from, and it was to develop common data elements. So common data elements that could be collected uniformly in uh, research studies. And there have been uh, publications by on for both adults and uh, for pediatrics. And the idea is that having these common data elements would support pooling of data uh, and sharing of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, results between studies and also hopefully uh, between international studies. <coughs> So this is the uh, common data elements as it's implemented in the center TBI study. It's a complicated diagram, uh, but it represents uh, uh, the, the, the fact that, that outcome assessment is essentially uh, quite uh, complex. And I'll just uh, uh, take you through it. What I've done here is to identify uh, the seven domains which are common to both the pediatric and adult assessments. These are the, 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 the shared uh, domains of assessment. And these are also the, the assessment domains that we are covering in the Centre TBI project. Um, <coughs> now, at the centre here, you have uh, a global outcome as before, so it's still retained there, but, it, but it's a number, of, a number of other things obviously are added, a number of other uh, assessment domains are added to, to complete the whole spectrum of, uh, uh, of uh, problems that people experience after TBI. So, firstly, there's the issues that I talked about in relation to mild TBI. There's the TBI symptoms, such as measured by the River Mead Post Concussion Questionnaire, psychological status, reported anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress. And these, these domains down here are, are uh, seen as being very important in terms of the uh, current assessment of, uh, of patients with TBI, capturing that, uh, uh, that men mental health dimension, and particularly capturing how the person feels, what, uh, what their actual uh, own experiences are. <clears throat> um, neuropsychological impairment is also an important part of that uh, assessment. So these, these are clearly uh, vital in terms of assessing patients with mild uh, moderate and with uh, and sometimes with severe TBIs as well, but at the other end of s the spectrum we have uh, s uh, scales which are important in defining uh, outcome in patients with uh, the most severe injuries. So the GCS doesn't define patients uh, properly who, uh, for example, are in the minim minimally conscious state. We need other types of assessment, uh, such as the coma recovery scale revised. These are these are quite uh, quite specialised assessments, but they need to be included in the whole picture. Similarly, physical function, very important, obviously, in severely in patients. We've heard about uh, uh, rehabilitation and how, what a key uh, uh, thing, uh, motor, motor function is, activities of daily living. So the focus is often here in terms of, uh, uh, of assessment. So it's important to include these things as part of the whole picture. Uh, one thing, one area here that's uh, relatively novel for TBI is health-related quality of life. Uh, uh, there's been a resistance to including uh, health-related uh, to quality of life measures in the TBI field, uh, and up until uh, about 15 years ago, there were certainly there were no uh, a, a specific health-related quality of life measures for TBI. And we were involved in a project. Uh, it was called the Calibri Project developing a measure specifically for a brain injury which would capture the areas which are typically affected. And what this involves is asking the patient how satisfied they are in particular areas and also how bothered they are by particular problems. And the areas uh, that of satisfaction are here and uh, bothered here. So they capture uh, not only the things that one would, one would expect from a quality of life measure, uh, such as uh, a, a uh, uh, social uh, relationships and uh, independence, uh, but also cognitive functioning, which wasn't part of, it's not part of the standard health-related quality of life measures, and also their perception of their self, uh, and also physical problems related to uh, brain injury. 
Now, this, the idea behind this kind of assessment is that you're asking the patient how they feel. It's their view of how they feel. You're not making a judgment about their outcome. You're letting them uh, speak. These patient-reported outcomes these are seen as being very important. And, in fact, uh, 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 the FDA uh, has a view that these such outcomes are actually to be preferred for clinical trials over uh, clinician-rated scales such as the... Uh, GOS. So, just to summarise, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the complete picture, as it were, involving a number of, number of different types of assessments. On the website, you find all the different recommended uh, measures. Uh, uh, there's actually over 180 in the complete common data elements. So, comment, just to, just to, to, to give some final comments on this scheme, um, one of the problems, <coughs> one of the problems here is, uh, is that there is just the, the multitude of, mem uh, of measures that are available, and one wonders whether there's possible to get uh, a, a smaller set, a, small, a core set of measures that could be used across uh, across different trials. Uh, another issue here is whether we need all of these different domains. Is it really necessary to have all of these different things included? And if you look at these, particularly these three domains and you look at the assessments that are used, you find that you're assessing uh, people's uh, 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 symptoms of depression, for example, uh, repeatedly. So there's, a, there's, there's overlap here that, uh, that should be resolved. Uh, and another thing, another issue for, uh, for future work and, uh, is that uh, in the old days when we had the Glasgow Outcome Scale, there was just a single number, and so we could just put that in and decide what the outcome was. But if you're including a number of different domains, you then have an issue about how you combine these into an overall outcome. How do you, there are ways of doing that, you can produce a composite, you can do global testing, but how you do it uh, affects uh, what, uh, uh, the outcome of your, of your trial. Uh, so just uh, leave, the, leave you with a number of questions there about, uh, about outcomes, which we hope will be answered uh, by the Centre TBI project over the next few years about whether what the key outcomes should be that, uh, that are incorporated uh, in TBI, whether the assessment tools are adequate and also uh, whether they're valid cross-culturally. We would, I mean, we want to be able to uh, compare trials in different uh, countries and compare what's done in the UK to what's done in India because we want to know what, whether the outcomes are the same, but we need the tools if we're going to do that. Uh, can, a, can we agree on a small set of standard measures that can be used? And then finally, this issue about how we combine these into an overall index. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilson. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any question from the audience? <coughs> Yes. It's correct data. That means number is very small. It is. In yes. India, India 1.6 lakhs people die. So if we compare the death to death for the population, India is 10 to 15 times higher. Yes. It's correct. Because we have about <coughs> 230 million people, and UK has around 75 to 80 million people. The, uh, India is 20 times the size of the UK yeah. in terms of population. So uh, in that proportion, India should have 60,000 deaths. Whereas we can manage to have 1.5 lakhs, right? So we are. I know, and I, I know there is a difference. Uh, I'm not an epidemiologist. So I don't know precisely what so it is. So how have you brought down the death? Uh, and, uh, it is a tremendously well, low death. Yeah, I think I think the w the thing that strikes me coming coming here would be road traffic uh, safety. That's a problem <laughs> that. I think we've <coughs> tackled pretty effectively in the UK. Um, so, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, that that's going to be a factor in the in the differences. Yes. Anybody else? That'll be the last question. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Um, we are also using Qualibri uh, in our institute. Uh -huh. it's, I think it's, it's an excellent scale. can be also used telephonically. I had one question in your um, uh, research for center TBI. 
For the neuropsychological impairment, are you only using CANTAV or are you also using any paper pencil tests? Uh, we're using the uh, Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test and the trail making. Um, we had a great deal of problems, in fact, implementing the, the recommended scales. The scales that come from uh, uh, these working groups which were established in the United States. And we were actually found it difficult to implement these across Europe because of the, uh, the way that they had originally been developed. Right. Yeah. Uh, so all these patients who come in, you are recruiting all of them who come? Or are they only specific to the type of TBI? Um, for this, on the for the TBI. Sorry, for this type of, for this, uh, for the study. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there are two arms. There's a registry arm in which, which is taking everybody that, uh, that uh, turns up and just taking some simple information. And then there's the actual recruitment of patients to, to the study, which will be selective based on uh, issues such as the person's willingness to consent mm -hmm. to, to follow up and so forth. So all kinds, mild okay. to severe. It's, it's right through the whole spectrum of uh, severity. And till yes. how long are you going to follow them up? Until two years in, su in a subgroup, but the main follow-up is until 12 months. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Wilson. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Jamuna Rajeshwaran, who is an additional professor in clinical psychology from Nimhans, Bangalore, and also head of neuropsychology unit at Nimhans. Dr. Jamuna. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashima, for that introduction. Respected chairpersons and dear delegates, a very good evening. And at the outset, I wish to thank Dr. Deepak for inviting me to give a talk in this important uh, uh, conference. Uh, well, I'm, I think I'm going against the principle of cognitive assessment itself. We, ad uh, we do not administer cognitive tests in the fag end of the day. Now, to make you all sit and listen to a cognitive task is a task for me to make it very interesting. Uh, I will, uh, the, the topic that I'm going to speak about is the EEG neurofeedback. Uh, the outline is that I'll give a brief introduction about EEG neurofeedback and then talk about the work that has been carried out. And then I have a video. Uh, I think if the chairpersons Permit me, because that video is a little longer, around uh, seven to eight minutes. I will play the video because that's very important, and that has paved a way for a further research in our institute. As all of us know, the research and science of human brain has virtually exploded with new information over the past decade. Now we know that brain is not rigid and it is plastic. It has the ability to change uh, and to a function in response to experience. We also know that brain can generate new brain cells, especially in the hippocampus. Now, clinicians and researchers have long searched for ways to influence mind towards optimal functioning. How are the methods for influencing brain activities such as surgery, psychopharmacology, electroconvulsive therapy are invasive or found to pr produce enormous side effects? Talk therapy is often found to be useful, but it needs to be integrated with biological and cognitive approaches. However, research has shown neurofeedback is an alternative approach that aims the individuals alter brain activation without introducing electrical or magnetic activity or pharmacological compounds into the brain, hence pre uh, preventing the brain from becoming dependent on outside influence and for better functioning. Now, EEG neurofeedback is a state of art training. It is an exercise to the brain. It is a mental workout. Since our brain is plastic, it can learn, change, improve, and heal. It is known that the circuitry changes are, and new neurons appear th throughout the life. Psychological disorders are characteristics by widespread alteration from normal circuitry in limbic frontal, stri frontal striatal and prefrontal regions. What neurofeedback does is it is producing effects by enhancing synaptic strength throughout through repeated firing and strengthening the circuit. The recent research has focused why does this neuro, how does this neurofeedback ha have a bearing on the improvement of the cognitive and the behavioral functioning. Now, the, the recent research, which I, after the, uh, uh, the case that I'm going to play the video, I went back to see what is this, how does this patient improve? Now they talk about the, uh, the connectome theories. Now the brainwave training addresses the small 
network. The smaller network gets strengthened and hence spreads to the larger networks. And this is what the research has been focusing on now. now as of all of us know, there are electrical and chemical activities in the brain. Neurofeedback targets are the electrical activity. The electrical signal is then magnified in some kind of the, the patient is uh, placed in front of a monitor where they have the uh, uh, electrodes placed depending on the site of the training that we focus on. We do a QEEG and then identify the deficit that is seen on the QEEG and then place the electrodes on a particular training wherever the training has to be given. And then that is connected to a computer where the task has been played. The per person co controls the task, not with the stylus or with any paper pencil, but just looking mentally controlling the task. Uh, we follow the 1020 international system. Then again, we have various, uh, we focus on dip different waves. As of now, research has shown that the alpha theta wave is more effective in many of the clinical conditions, be it uh, traumatic brain injury, alcohol dependence, or schizophrenia, or even in many of the psychiatric conditions. As all of us know, normal brain has good balance of the brain waves. It has the ability to shift easily from one brain state to the other. Whereas the dysfunctional brain does, does not, has too many, uh, too much of some frequencies over the others too much of some frequency or the unstable frequencies and neurofeedback helps in restoring the better balance of the waves in various parts of the brain. Coming to the uh, traumatic brain injury, it is a silent epidemic of, of modern times. Uh, there are more number of people surviving with brain injury than people dying. Most affected are between the ages of 15 to 45, the ratio of male is to female is 3 is to 1. And it is estimated that by 2020, India will occupy the third position. Looking at the scenario, the uh, responsibility of the healthcare professionals is tremendous in terms of rehabilitating and sending back these patients to the uh, gainful employment. So there are, as many of the speakers have said, there are post-concussion uh, symptoms that is prevalent. There is <coughs> stress. There is the quality of uh, life compromised. And cognition, yes, there is attention problem. Even our own studies have shown that there is deficits in attention, working memory, and fMRI studies have also shown that there is, cognitive, uh, there is compromise of cognitive tasks, uh, imp uh, implying that TBI has compromised their cognitive abilities. And the higher cognitive executive functions are compromised, memory is compromised, social cognition is compromised, and deficits prevail much, uh, if, the, if it is not taken care, it goes on much beyond, uh, and it remains for the long term. There are also studies showing that st there is structural deficits, even in mild TBI, and in EEG studies have shown increased delta theta and decreased alpha, Biochemical studies have shown in increased cortisol, increased uh, levels of cortisol. So with this, what we did was initially we carried out a study just looking at the effects, effects of EEG neurofeedback or pre-post in, in, in a group of uh, TBI patients uh, uh, compared uh, patients who did not have undergo the neurofeedback training. We saw a significant improvement in this group. And hence, we wanted to know the process that is involved. How did these patients improve? So what we did was we took up another study where we also looked at, into the clinical, cognitive, electrophysiological, and biochemical variables. Uh, the group was, we had uh, uh, homogeneous inclusion, uh, exclusion criteria that we followed. Then uh, there were some uh, outcome scales that we uh, administered on these uh, uh, patients. And we also included the, the cognitive test. The neurofeedback was given only to 30 patients, uh, what we called as a treatment group, and 30 patients treatment as usual group. And it was all males. So the effect of EEG neurofeedback training on clinical variables, we saw significant reduction in the severity of symptoms, perceived stress, and enhancement of quality of life in the neurofeedback group as against the treatment as usual group. 
The reduction of traumatic, uh, post-traumatic stress has been found to be associated with the reduction of post-concussive syndromes. The studies have shown this. The identification of post-concussive symptoms related to stress is therefore indicative in directing and prioritizing clinical interventions. Effectiveness of uh, neurofeedback training on cognitive variables. We did see a significant change in the new EEG neurofeedback group as against the treatment as usual group. Uh, this is the graph. The first the table is where we see the red lines are the improvement that has occurred on all the cognitive uh, domains as against the group which did not undergo the neurofeedback training. Except that in some of the variables we did see some changes, improvement in the treatment as usual group also. So in conclusion we, s we found that uh, in, in, uh, as compared to the electrophysiological data that we saw, uh, sh it showed theta-alpha ratio had significantly reduced and alpha-beta ratios have significantly increased within most of the sessions from baseline to actual training period. So the effectiveness of EG neurofeedback training on biochemical variables we saw, uh, we did the BDNF and the cortisol level. BDNF, we did not see much of the changes. There was no significant changes. However, in cortisol, we did see a ch uh, decrease in cortisol in the neurofeedback group. So the results of this study show that NFT is useful in improving clinical and cognitive function. Electrophysiological changes were seen and biochemical changes in terms of decrease in cortisol were seen in the EG neurofeedback group. Uh, we did uh, look into the fMRI study in two of the cases. We looked at the default mode network where we did uh, neuropsychological assessment. We also did some outcome scales. The results of these two cases showed that uh, EEG neurofeedback increase in cortisol uh, of, uh, in the gray matter and the FA value of the cortical white matter tracts also was seen. There were decrease in uh, there was significant decrease in global local efficiency cost and clustering coefficient in the FA values. Interestingly, there was also significant increase in the thalamocortical connections after EEG NFT. With this, we are, uh, we are pursuing an RCT study. We are looking into the fMRI on the larger group, which is underway now. I'll just play the video. I'll, I'll see if, if the time doesn't permit, I'll just cut short the video. Uh, uh, this is a patient, 27-year-old uh, male, who met with a severe head injury. Uh, uh, December 2013, the first time was when he was attending a wedding, he was sitting behind the bike. जैसे कि लोगों ने बताया कि सामने से एक टैंकर थी उनकी गलती की वजह से सही सिग्नल नहीं दे पाने की वजह से जो ड्राइव कर रहा था उसने सडनली ब्रेक डाला और वो गिर गया रोड पे ओके फिर इनिशियली उसको बहुत सुनने में आया कि उसका ब्लड बहुत पास हो गया था थोड़ी देर बाद किसी ने उठाकर एम्बुलेंस बुला के उसको इनिशियल ट्रीटमेंट देकर फिर उड़पी हॉस्पिटल में उसको एडमिट किया गया फिर दो दिन डॉक्टर ने उसका ट्रीटमेंट करने के बाद बोला कि उसका ब्रेन 80 परसेंट डैमेज हो गया है इसमें कोई होप ही नहीं है ऐसा बोला डॉक्टर ने हमें न्यूरो प्रोफेसर ने बताया कि इसका 80 परसेंट ब्रेन डैमेज है कुछ ज्यादा होप नहीं है बहुत ज्यादा ब्लड क्लॉट्स वगैरह है 27 डेज वो वो जो उड़पी हॉस्पिटल में वो था वहाँ पे हमने उसको ट्वेंटी सेवन डेज था तीन ऐसे ही कोमा स्टेज में था वो तीन दिन बाद अपनी आँख खोला कुछ भी मोमेंट नहीं था उसके बॉडी में ना आँख भी ब्लिंक नहीं हो रहा था उसका ऐसे लेवेंट डेज एक दिन उसको वेंटिलेटर पे रखा गया था उसी रात को वन ऑफ द ड्यूटी डॉक्टर ने बोला कि इसका कोई अभी चांस ही नहीं है अभी एक दो घंटे में कुछ हो जाएगा इसको बुलाना है रात के दो बजे सब रिश्तेदारों को बुला लिया गया कि कोई हो भी नहीं था उसका अभी कुछ भी हो सकता है किसको बुलाना है दिखाना है दिख दो फिर फिर लेवेंट डेज के बाद नेक्स्ट डे उसका हालत में सुधार आ गया 
डॉक्टर ने बोला जान का खतरा नहीं है अभी बट जस्ट बॉडी कोमा में थी उसकी कुछ भी मोमेंट नहीं था जैसे ऐसे कुछ भी बोलो कुछ भी बोलो कुछ भी रिएक्ट ही नहीं करता था वो उसके बाद 27 डेज वही हॉस्पिटल में 11 डेज के बाद वार्ड में शिफ्ट किया वार्ड में शिफ्ट करने की इसकी हालत बहुत खराब होती थी इसका बदन पसीने में स्वेटिंग एक्सेसिव स्वेटिंग होता था मगर वो डॉक्टर ने कुछ